Acts chapter 8, verse 26. As for Philip, an angel of the Lord said to him, go south down to the desert road that runs from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out and he met the treasurer of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of Ethiopia. The eunuch had gone to Jerusalem to worship and he was now returning. Seated in his carriage, he was reading aloud from the book of the prophet Isaiah. The Holy Spirit said to Philip, go over and walk along beside the carriage. Philip ran over and heard the man reading from the prophet Isaiah. And Philip asked, do you understand what you're reading? And the man replied, how can I unless someone instructs me? And so he urged Philip to come up into the carriage and sit with him. The passage of scripture he had been reading was this. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. He was humiliated and received no justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. And the eunuch asked Philip, tell me, was the prophet speaking about himself or someone else? And so beginning with this same scripture, Philip told him the good news about Jesus. As they rode along, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, there's some water. Why can I be baptized? He ordered the carriage to stop and he went down into the water and Philip baptized him. When they came out of the water, the spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away and the eunuch never saw him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Meanwhile, Philip found himself further north at the town of Azotus, and he preached the good news there in every town along the way until he came to Caesarea. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. I'm going to call this sermon this morning, Outpost at Gaza. Uh, you, know, you know, you hear the word Gaza in the news even today, and, uh, and because Gaza is all, has always been in between things. And Gaza was, at the time of this writing, and is now at the, uh, a crossroads. It's, it connects Africa with Asia. It connects Israel to Egypt. Uh, and so I wanted to just talk about this place and what happened there in this story, because I believe that St. Luke, who is the writer of the book of Acts, re- wants to remind the readers that the story Uh, the story reveals certain things that we need to pay attention to in uh, in our understanding of uh, the ministry of Christ. So he first reminds us that the story occurs on a wilderness road. That's what we would call a secondary road. It's not the main highway. It's not out on, on the main thoroughfare where things are usually occurring. And so with that in mind, let's look at this story. Now, what we didn't read today is right before this happens, we find Philip the evangelist uh, is in, is in uh, Samaria. And, uh, and Luke tells us that uh, he's having astounding success there. Multitudes are coming to Christ, and, and there's healings of all different kinds, signs and wonders, uh, and uh, demons are coming out of people with, with loud voices and so forth. And suddenly the Lord speaks to Philip that he wants him to leave that place of ministry, this place of very uh, successful ministry, and just trust him to go out to a secondary road, to a place far away from the thoroughfare of things where there's not a lot of people because he has somebody there he wants him to meet. And of course, we find out very soon who it is he wants us to meet. So this, sto- I have to move along with this sermon because unlike uh, somewhere in, in time, it was decreed that pastor sermons were to have three points, and this one has six points. <laughs> uh, and so it has to move around rather quickly, and you won't remember the points. So hopefully you'll remember a, a line or two as your mind wanders here and there as they want to do. I'd like to say that I don't have that problem, but I do too. And that's just natural. So we just trust the Holy Spirit to pull you in uh, when you need to be pulled in. I think, first of all, that uh, Luke wants us to define the meaning of success uh, as it relates to the work of Christian evangelism. Uh, and, and in his view, and we see this throughout the book of Acts, uh, success is 
a, a quality of reaching new people groups much more than it is in reaching more individuals. And this is one story where this becomes very clear. Because Philip is having enormous success preaching in, to Samaria, and multitudes are there. He has a successful thing going. This is great. And suddenly the Lord calls him out from that place to a situation where he does not have uh, nearly the kind of, of uh, apparent success that he, he has had in this other uh, place of ministry. And you know, it, uh, one thing about this that we have to always take in, and that is we do not get to decide in our lifetimes what is success and what is not when it comes to the fruit of our Christian life. There are some people on this earth whose name will never be known who have sown seeds that will, maybe in a generation or two, take root. A Sunday school teacher, for example. I think about the Sunday school teachers I had when I was a little boy in the basement of the church. And in those days, you know, we had, we'd have church upstairs. And the basement was, was kind of like not completely underground, but halfway underground. Uh, and it had a certain smell. It was kind of like incense for Pentecostals. It was, <laughs> it was musty kind of cinder block mixed with crayons and glue. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And when you walked in there, that's what church smelt like. That's also where you had potlucks, uh, and, uh, which sometimes also smelt like musty walls and uh, crayons. But that's another story. But then we go down in, into, into there, and then uh, in, in these little uh, cinder block rooms, those very sparse, you know, concrete floors, cinder block uh, uh, walls painted, then there was a, what was called a flannel graph. A flannel graph was kind of a, a Stone Age uh, video screen. <laughs> and uh, and little, little cutouts of Bible characters was placed on the flannel graph and they stuck. And you could not ask one week why last week that figure was Moses, but this week it's Elijah. <laughs> because the teacher would send you out and then you'd be punished by your parents for insubordination and a spirit of rebellion. But the fact is, it was, it was a wonder how in one week a figure could be transfigured from being Moses to being Elijah and your mind just wondered about such things. But the teacher was adept at telling the story in between setting kids down and, and uh, so forth. Um, which now I've lost why I was uh, telling uh, all of that. Uh, but you know, that, uh, who knows but what some of those Sunday school teachers and, uh, uh, and some of the kids that they had such behavior problems with go on to do things uh, for the Lord uh, and, and blessing humanity in the Lord's name in ways that that teacher may never see. Or... Uh, she may make the difference or he may make the difference in that person coming to faith in the Lord and then that person's children go on to do good. So we don't get to uh, decide what we've done uh, that have been successful uh, until we come to the, um, to the, to the throne of, of grace and the Lord tells us what we have done in secret is now to be shouted from the housetops. And this is what happens in this story. The second point is, is that Luke wants us to notice Philip's attitudes and motives. I think Philip is the opposite of Jonah. Jonah is a jerk. Uh, he may be the prophet of the Lord, but he's a jerk. Uh, the people of Nineveh are nicer people than Jonah. Jonah's a bad person. Uh, why God chooses bad people sometimes to carry his gospel, I don't know. I've met them along the way, and I'm like, are they saved? Uh, they're going you know, to the ends of the earth to save other people, but have they been saved? We're not sure. Uh, this is what we think about Jonah. The Lord says, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh. He decides instead to go to Cartagena, uh, which is a, has nice beaches and so forth. He gets in the boat, you know, and you know that he's, God sends this, the fish and everything. Finally, you know, he ought to get in the hints along the way. He's puked up by a fish, which was better than the other exit route that's possible uh, when you were in a fish. But still not all that pleasant. Uh, and so Jonah, Jonah comes to Nineveh, and, and, you know, his message is clear. Yea, in 40 days and 40 nights, I will destroy this city. There will not be left one person. There will not be left an animal. I'm going to thoroughly destroy this place because of your sin. Thus saith the Lord, which he was happy to deliver. 
What he was not happy about is the people of Nineveh said, gosh, we didn't know this. And they fall on their knees. They repent. Even the animals go on a fast. And, and the Lord says, look at that. Isn't that wonderful? And the Lord's heart of compassion is turned. He saves the people of Nineveh. But Jonah is not happy because why, why should God save the Ninevites? Because they're a despicable people. Philip doesn't do this. Philip, in the midst of this great revival Samaria, doesn't look up to God and say, are you kidding me? Are you looking? Have you been aware of all this wonderful stuff that's being done for your glory? Of course, but look. And uh, he doesn't do that. Philip just says, I'm on my way because the master of the harvest has asked him to trust him to go speak, uh, as he will soon find out, to one person. The third thing that, that Luke wants us to notice is that Philip's convert is an Ethiopian. And, and by the way, this is something we miss throughout most of history. Uh, the Ethiopian eunuch was a Jew, almost certainly. Because by this time, from the time of Jeremiah, at least, and maybe before then, great numbers of Ethiopians had been Jews. Uh, there was a big row about this. In I remember in, in my teenage years, because uh, Jews in Ethiopia wanted to return to Israel, and they were uh, they were uh, saying that they had the right of return, like any any Jew in the world. Uh, and the uh, the Jews of Ethiopian descent were saying, "No, you're not real Jews, and this is for real Jews." But of course, once we got to genetic, um, able to do genetic testing with the Genome Project and so forth, we discovered that actually the Ethiopian Jews were more had more originally Semitic uh, roots uh, than the Ethiopian uh, than the European Jews, which had mixed with uh, other nations more. So the Ethiopian Jews actually have a stronger claim uh, to being uh, uh, truly ethnic Jews from from the first century than do the Jews that uh, came from uh, Europe. And that's a, just a fascinating story. So a lot of e Ethiopia had already been Jew, had already uh, had, had converted to Judaism, and many of them also were descendants of, uh, of marriages between the uh, Israelites and uh, the, uh, the Ethiopian people, beginning evidently with Queen Sheba who went to visit Solomon, and when she said the half was not been told, that she was telling the truth there because she went home with a descendant that the Ethiopians claim uh, was Solomon's child. So Ethiopia had been linked to the Holy Land for a long time. Uh, it was not unusual for Ethiopian to go to worship uh, in Israel because they were Jews. They wanted to go to Jerusalem, to the temple, like anyone else. Uh, but we're supposed to notice this. We're supposed to notice that he is an Ethiopian, and we're going to see why in just a moment. Uh, one thing that we need to realize is that, uh, is that the Lord always wanted to reach other peoples of the, of the world, and we'll see that in just a moment. So first, let's just get in our mind that, uh, that Philip, uh, who is a Jew that's lived in uh, his lifetime uh, in the Holy Land, uh, is confronting a man that has also been to the temple to pray uh, and to go for the festivals and so forth, but uh, he is an Ethiopian. The next thing that Luke wants us to notice is that this convert is a eunuch. Uh, now, a eunuch, uh, that's a problem because a eunuch is someone whose gender doesn't fit into any neat kind of category. Uh, and so in the Old Testament, a eunuch is not allowed to go into the temple of the Lord, right? Now, this is beginning to change by the end of the uh, Old Testament. We begin to see the prophet saying uh, something like, like, don't let the eunuch say that I am a dry tree, for I will give to you uh, a, a fruit that's better than sons and daughters, says the Lord. But, uh, you know, the, the, the prophet said it, but the people don't really get it. So eunuchs, eunuchs are not... Uh, are not welcome in God's house. They're kind of uncertain. They don't fit into the categories. And Jesus had already pointedly said, some people were born eunuchs, some people were made eunuchs by, uh, by human beings, and others became eunuchs uh, for the kingdom of God. In other, in other words, celibate. Let them that can receive it, receive it. In other words, the Lord says, they're welcome into the kingdom of God. The Lord opens up the doors uh, to the eunuchs. Um, of which there were many in the ancient world. 
And I'd like to just say something about that because we're going to look in, in, in a moment, we're going to go back to the idea of this uh, Ethiopian uh, ethnicity. But I want to talk just a second about the whole idea about the importance in our times of having a, uh, as clear a word as we possibly can have about sexual ethics in, in light of the Me Too movement and all the stuff that goes uh, on around us now. Uh, many times from a more secular position and people take up their positions depending on how they feel about things from a secular standpoint. But we're trying to root ourselves in the Word of God. And so that's tonight. Tonight we're having this, this discussion because there are so many people in our world who have been wounded by sexual life. What God gives to us as a blessing to nourish our soul uh, through a sexual encounter has, in, for so many people, uh, been misused in a way that has made their life full of pain and sorrow. And many times these people either can't, can't, uh, they can't really connect to someone uh, sexually, that's one outcome of this, or it can be that they're promiscuous, or it can be that they're just furious and full of anger and we don't want to deal with that. But uh, didn't our Lord Jesus say, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And so in the words of our Lord, as he begins uh, to ta uh, talk to us about this idea of eunuchs, there is in this passage, I think, the idea that we, we must realize that uh, every, everybody does not have the same story that we, we have. You may be sitting by someone whose story is very painful. You cannot imagine some of the horrors they've gone through. If there's been uh, incest in their family or uh, if they have been abused by someone. And unfortunately, the, the church is not an exception. We have to be watchful because uh, much sexual abuse has occurred even in the church with people that we have trusted. And we want to be able to trust. We want we, we, we long to be able to trust, but unfortunately, sometimes that trust is violated. And in some of the churches that we were raised in, that if you question anybody, then you were a bad person and you were kind of wicked, evil-minded or whatever, uh, and it wasn't okay to say, this doesn't look good or this doesn't seem right to me or the way you were talking to me didn't seem right, the way you touched me didn't seem right. Some of that, at times that hugs a little bit too long. And it's like, there's the love of Jesus, I'm sure, but there might be a little spark of something else. Hello? Right? And, but we're not allowed to say, uh, okay, I think it was a little bit too much. Right? And when that occurs, people begin to be wounded in ways that, that they don't know how to express. So tonight, it's just our little way of saying, the people of God are open, uh, are open to hear your story and that, and that we, we will be a safe place as we know how to be a place of healing. What does it mean to be a eunuch? You are, you are, not, you are not a participant in, uh, in one of uh, human life's uh, most enjoyable and, uh, and normal uh, experiences. So, you know, it's not just being a, 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 a eunuch, of course, uh, literally speaking, as someone whose genitals have been removed uh, usually before puberty. But, uh, and so they develop in very different ways than, than uh, other people. Uh, but, you know, you can use it metaphorically, too. There's lots of folks that just feel like they can't fit in. They can't find a niche. And so the Lord Jesus also says to them, come unto me, all you weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And so the people of God have to find a way to do that too. Obviously, we have certain moral standards that the scripture teaches, and we take a stand on that, but we have to always be cautious in the way that we are presenting ourselves because we never know the jokes that we're telling and the ways that we are, the things that we're doing might be deeply wounding someone to, that is making their way Christward. And so uh, Philip doesn't say, wow, what's it like to be like in your condition? He doesn't do any of that. He just jumps up into the chariot and he begins to talk to him. What? The story of Jesus. The story of Jesus. He tells him the gospel. Well, here's the next thing. Luke wants us to notice that this Ethiopian eunuch is reading the scripture 
And what we find out very soon is he could find no one in Jerusalem to explain to him the text. He went to the center of the faith. He had made a long journey of pilgrimage. And when he got there, he could not find... Are you kidding me? Jerusalem is full of people talking about the text. But the Ethiopian eunuch could not find a place where someone would say, hey, you're you're from a long way. Come in here and join our circle as we begin to talk about the text. It is not unlike a great number of our churches in this city and throughout our country who do not really have a welcome door open to those who come from other places. And how many people come close to our churches that really don't know how to get in? Oh, there's no sign saying you're not welcome. If they go in, nobody tells them you can't come here. But many times you can feel the doors not open. This Ethiopian eunuch had made a pilgrimage from his homeland. He was a Jew. He was filled with joy. No doubt it was the first time that he had gone to Jerusalem. He was so excited. And when he got there, Evidently, there was not anyone that would explain to him the word of God, which was his great desire to know. One of the great themes of the New Testament is about how Jews and Christians were splitting. Early Christians were Jews, but there was a split occurring in New Testament times, not only about the person of Jesus, But perhaps even more, uh, the hotter issue in the New Testament, we see this in many, many places, is that the communities that were, were splitting over this one single issue are the promises of Abraham given to Abraham's blood descendants or to everyone who follows Abraham's faith. So this is what uh, one of the issues that the Apostle Paul raises in Romans chapter 2, verse 29. Paul says, what is a Jew? Well, I mean, are we kidding? You're a rabbi and you've got to ask that question. Paul says, no. He says, being a Jew is not primarily a matter of being a blood descendant of Abraham. Being a Jew is primarily concerned, uh, is, is about uh, whether you have received the faith that Abraham received and are you walking in the way that Abraham walked. And he says clearly in Galatians that once there was a a wall of separation that separated Jew and Gentile, but Jesus Christ has torn it down. And he says now that everybody has been made fellow citizens with the saints who have trusted in Christ so that there is no longer Jew nor Gentile nor male nor female, right? Nor master or slave, but one in Christ Jesus. We keep trying to build the wall back up, and the Lord keeps trying to tear it down. This is a wall that doesn't need to exist. Everybody that wants to be one of Abraham's children, all you have to do is to trust in the last legitimate king of Israel, Jesus Christ, son of David, who declared that everybody that wants citizenship in this kingdom are welcome. Hallelujah. Today's reading from Psalm 22 says, All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all families of the earth will worship him. The prophet says that uh, that the Lord says, Israel is my firstborn, but Egypt and Syria are also mine, and also the children of, of Lebanon. Hallelujah the whole earth and all it contains. And this goes all the way back to Genesis 12 when the Lord meets with Abraham and said, in you, all families of the earth will be blessed. Hallelujah. So Luke here is dealing with the same issue. He's asking, is is this African eunuch a real Jew? Evidently, the people in Jerusalem were saying no. Despite what God had said to Abraham, despite what the prophets had said at the end of the Old Testament, this man could not be a Jew. But Philip went out of his way. Indeed, the Holy Spirit had gone out of his way to say something very different. 
Now remember where Philip had been when the Spirit called him to meet with this Ethiopian. He had been with Samaritans. Well, there's another problem. You remember the lady at the well? She says, oh, what are you doing talking to me? You're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan. Why are you talking to me? And he's like, Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. So the Samaritans claim to be Jews. They claim to follow the law of Moses. They claim to even be descendants of Jacob. The Jews said, no, you're not. Jesus said to his disciples, I'm going to go through Samaria and they said, whoa, why are you doing that for? Because Jews usually would walk around Samaria. And he says, I must needs go through Samaria. So I got some business there. And he starts with a woman that even the Samaritans didn't think highly of. And Jesus said, it's not a matter of whether you worship here or in Jerusalem. The Lord's just seeking those that worship him in spirit and in truth. I've got water for you that if you drink of this water, you'll never thirst again. And she runs to the village and says, I've got, you've got to come meet a man like I've never met before. Is he not the Christ? Praise God. We're getting here to the very tender crux of what the Lord, how the Lord defined his ministry. Do you know here's an interesting story. Early fo- earlier, the early followers of Muhammad when, in Muhammad's lifetime tried to join the synagogue at, at Medina. At that time, Muslims were facing Jerusalem as they prayed, and they were trying to learn the, the writings and so forth. They didn't yet have a Quran, and uh, they were rejected. They weren't allowed to come to the synagogue. I wonder how history could have been different if they had been welcomed. This has been an issue all along throughout history to say is faith related to ethnicity and nationality, or is it simply a matter of everybody who wants to follow God and to learn of Him are welcomed into a new kind of family where all these distinctions do not exist? I um, need to wrap it up. Uh, Sometimes a message like this goes over like an empty care package. Is Christ Church an outpost at Gaza? Or would it rather be one of the congregations in Jerusalem? I have been in places where there's not very many evangelical Christians. I've spent a large portion of my life in places like that, like Quebec, um, Latin America in those days, today it's different, even Phoenix, where uh, to be evangelical Christian is being a minority. But the evangelical church is something of the state church of the South and has had a privileged position in, in, in a define, defining the culture and also having power, political power, and that's changing, um, but Uh, it's still somewhat true. And uh, I'm not saying that's a good thing or a bad thing. It's mixed. It can be a good thing. I'm glad that we have great influence uh, on our culture and all that. But there's some downsides too. And part of the downside is just feeling entitled just because. And you're a Christian just because you breathe air and you're a Southerner. Right? You know, you may not go to church very often, but by golly, you're a Christian and you're going to fight for Christianity you're going to break some heads if, you know, if somebody misuses your faith or whatever. And, and, uh, and so, you know, sometimes that hinders uh, the work of the gospel. And it really hinders the work of the gospel when we begin to ask, what is evangelism? I, I remember, and maybe I, I shouldn't tell this story, but I'm going to. So, uh, when I was in... When I was in um, Phoenix, there was a well-respected large church, and I, I liked them. I, I really liked the pastor and uh, appreciate them and their work in the city. And they did Alpha, and I love the Alpha series, so I was really glad to hear they were doing Alpha. And they started having success, but it was a problem. 
because their greatest success were that Spanish-speaking people were showing up in droves to take Alpha and wanted to convert and be a part of the church. And the leaders of the church shut it down. And I know this because someone that was in the meeting that was uh, in the, uh, over the Alpha ministry because, quote, these folks are not our targeted audience. So I sent word and said, send them all over here. They're our targeted audience. And I told the pastor, shame on you. This is ungodly, unchristian. And whether you succeed or fail at your mission, this is utterly incompatible with the gospel of Jesus. No, it's about the marketing. You know, you see, you have a targeted audience and people, it's been shown in study after study that people prefer worshiping with their own kind. I said, yeah, it's called original sin. <laughs> they, also, they also prefer getting drunk, you know, on Friday nights with their friends and, ha and committing adultery and everything else. The ox is laid at the root of the tree. There comes a time in the gospel when we have to decide, are we going to try to live this thing? Whatever our friends and neighbors say is success, what are we going to do? And I'm telling you, Christ Church, that is a decision you're going to have ahead to decide what are you going to say is the mission God has laid upon this particular congregation. And will you be faithful when the people on the left doesn't like it? And will you be faithful when the people on the right doesn't like it? And are you willing to be other than almost everybody else in order to be faithful to the teachings of Jesus Christ? Jesus says in John 15, abide in me and you will bear much fruit. How do we abide in him? We walk after his teachings. We're faithful to him. And sometimes it causes you all kind of mind-bending things. You get associated with people that you have no kind of compatibility with. Or you think you don't. I remember the first time I went in a 12-step group. Oh, you know, a therapist thought I should be in a 12-step group. Like, why? I'm everything's okay. He didn't think so, but that's because he was short-sighted. But, you know. So I went to the 12-step group. So they went around, you know, they're there for, you know, whatever, you know. I'm like, whoa, oh, oh, you know, hearing all these stories. So my, my answer was, well, I'm here because I'm a pastor and I'm just trying to understand people who are having difficulty and relate to them. Whoa, they called me names. They used profanity. They, they had no respect for my position. I'm like, wow. I went back the next week and the next week. And little by little, I realized that some of those groups were doing more gospel work than I had ever seen done within the, within the walls of a church. And I'm like, why? Why? Well, people repent. They actually repent. They don't say, well, yes, well, praise God. How are you doing? I'm fine. Praise God. I'm in victory. Hallelujah. Even though you got a drug problem, you're taking prescription drugs a doctor didn't give you. Hello? You got all this stuff going on. You think Christians don't have all this going on, even though you got some kind of internet thing going on you don't want anybody to know about. Hello, I'm in victory, praise God. I am, a, I am an overcomer by the word of Jesus, hallelujah. No, and in the 12-step group, you've got to actually tell the truth. And then sometimes you get well because you tell the truth, because the truth will set you free. Many times all this stuff has to come around the church because the church refuses to do its work because it wants to look good to the people in Jerusalem. What I want to know, are you ready to be a crossroads in Gaza? Well, no place to end when you don't have just these scattered notes, but just to quit. One of the things that occurs to us is we, 
as we minister in a different way than what some churches felt called to minister. Is as an outpost at Gaza, we run into people with not just felt needs. Well, I like lattes, you know, after church. Well, I'll give you a latte after church. Well, I like the lights to be dim. We'll dim the lights. I like this kind of music rather than that kind of music. We'll give it to you. Rather that kind of consumer-driven Christianity, we have people showed up that need to eat, have clothes. And so, you know, we, we have a lot of benevolence needs. And it's first directed toward the members of the household of faith, just like the Word of God tells us, but also people who wander in that we haven't met before. And we screen them. We have people that are really wise. They don't allow me to meet with those people because I'll just go ahead and give them stuff. But <laughs> we have wiser people than me doing that uh, who, who vet, thing, vet folks and so forth. But how many times have we've had through the years people come back and say, two years ago I was coming through town and I was just destitute and you helped me. I want to give back. Or people who make their way into this congregation that you don't know who one time was homeless and now have a place, roof over their heads, a job, doing the work of the kingdom out here in this in-between space at Gaza.